Welcome to the Nonprofit Show. We're so glad you're back. And today we have with us a brand new guest joining us, but not new with the company. So Bloomerang, Melissa Pinard is here. Really glad to have you joining us, Melissa, to talk to us about best practices as it relates to volunteer management. So excited to have you on and, and we'll be asking you to share a little bit about yourself in just a moment. But before we do that, we want to remind all of you who we are. So hello to you, Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And Julia and I are so very honored to have the continued support from our amazing presenting sponsors, mm -hmm. including Bloomerang, where Melissa joins us from, also the American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Thank you so very much to these companies that invest in us, but really invest in the sector. So they're here truly to help you elevate your mission and do more good. So check them out. They've got some really great resources and some really great team members. And they have helped us to produce nearly 900 episodes starting in March of 2020. So if you haven't done so yet, I know, mind-blowing, now is the time to download the app. If you're looking at the screen, you can scan the QR code. And just a couple of hours after our live conversation with Melissa right now, you will get the notification that the recording has been uploaded. We're still on the streaming broadcast platforms several of them, as well as podcast platforms. So make sure you check us out if you missed any of our prior episodes, or maybe you didn't miss them. You just want to go back and listen again. So there's a lot of really good free information in there. Absolutely. So today's guest, as I shared just a bit earlier, joins us from Bloomerang, in fact, from Canada. So really excited to have you here. Melissa Pinard, Head of Product Management, Bloomerang Volunteer. Welcome to you. Thank you. It's so great to be here. And first and foremost as well, thank you to the nonprofit show and thank you to all of your listeners out there too for the opportunity to share. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be here. So thanks for that. Um, so my name is Melissa Pinard. I am the head of product management here at Bloomerang Volunteer and actually the previous co-founder of that product. So I have been living and breathing the volunteer management problem for uh, well over a decade now. Um, and I have seen a wide range of how organizations go about solving this problem and how they go about kind of tackling things, right? So I've learned a lot of great tips over the years and I'm just really looking forward to sharing them with you today. I, love, I think this is fascinating. And so congratulations and good for you because you know it's, it's one thing to understand the ecosystem of volunteer management, what's in it for everybody, but how we get to the best practices so that everybody is happy, the organization is successful, the volunteers, feel successful and and the management of it really had I've seen so many times when people walk away and they're like oh this organization this was the worst or others that are like oh my gosh you know if I win the lottery it's going 100% to them tomorrow <laughs> right you know I mean it seems yeah. like it's it's two ways so first and foremost on the uh, first and foremost on the the best practices for number one, you say create job descriptions. Talk to us about that, Melissa. Yeah, absolutely. So job descriptions play a key role in the volunteer recruitment process specifically. So um, the more specific you get with them, um, the more it will allow volunteers to kind of self-screen. Um, and it will also give them a stronger purpose and understanding of what they're supposed to be doing, right? So, so when I say self-screening. I mean, it gives them enough important information that the volunteers will know whether or not they're interested or can even perform the job before they even sign up, right? That self-screening will help eliminate any friction points on the administration side and save a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. I'm fascinated because I was thinking when they walk through the door and they sign in, then that's where you're, where you're communicating this. But you're saying way before that. I mean, Jared, oh, yeah. I interrupted you, but do, do you see this, Jared? 
You know, I've, I've started to see this more and more and I value this greatly because it brings clarity, right, to both sides of the party. Um, but my question was going to be, Melissa, does the word job description confuse them? Are they expecting a paycheck at the end of this? Good question. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yes and no. Job description really is all about the the role that they're going to be performing. And when you're creating, if you want to call them job descriptions, role descriptions, I've heard in the past too, you, you really want to touch on some key points on those. So for example, obviously you want to outline what the job entails, right? Um, maybe include how many hours, how frequent you're going to want their help. Um, does it require certain qualifications, certifications, or skill sets, right? Um, maybe you even want to talk about who they report to. Uh, some things I've seen too outlined in these are, is it labor intensive? Like, will it require you to lift a certain weight limit? Maybe, you know, they're working at a food bank and they have to carry around, you know, those heavy food pan like pampers. Um, can they even do that? You know, some of them have age restrictions. Um, we mentioned earlier where is it happening? Is it virtual? Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? Is it accessible? Can you access it by public transit, right? Um, so, so also in those descriptions, whether they're job descriptions, role descriptions, um, recommendations on what to do, what to wear, you know, maybe they need to wear clothes, toed shoes, what they need to bring as well. So water, sunscreen, you know, maybe they're working in a garden and need to be in worker gloves, um, but just getting really descriptive with the recommendations. Now, what I've also seen in the past with these are some additional motivators. And these are kind of what I call the cherry on top where they're a little bit harder to write, but they go a long way. And this is all about addressing how their work in this job is going to contribute to the organization's objectives and goals and really try and hit on what will they personally gain out of the experience working for your organization, right? Because they're not giving their money, they're giving their time. What are they going to receive in return? Oh, I love that. And Absolutely. that's what I have seen that's missing, right? Like I don't wow. see that piece of it, Melissa. So I really, I really appreciate you, you doing that. Um, and talking more about it. Tip number two is interesting to me too. And it's about valuing your volunteers. And I'm curious because what you just said about like the benefits of this, what are they going to learn? How is this going to impact the mission? Talk to us about valuing our volunteers. Cause I'm really curious if that does tie into what you previously just said. Mm -hmm, a little bit actually. So you know, most likely everyone in your organization appreciates your volunteers and what they do for you, but do your volunteers know that, right? So valuing your volunteers is all about cultivating and fostering volunteer relationships. That's something that takes time. It takes multiple key touch points, right? And they need to feel appreciated, which is kind of like the secret sauce to volunteer retention. You can't just, you know, interact with them once, thank them once, and be done with it, right? It's just like any relationship, it's give and take. So they keep giving their time and you as an organization need to keep giving back to them in other ways, right? And there's all sorts of strategies and stuff I can hit on. Um, if you guys are interested in hearing about some of those ideas that you can take a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. tell us what one of those might be. Yeah, give us yeah. a taste of that because that's a fascinating discussion to, I think to really drill down on. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's, uh, I get so excited about this because there's so many things you can do, but um, even something as simple as, you know, a mass thank you email, even after they've finished mm -hmm. their work or completed a task, mm -hmm. something as simple as remembering their birthdays or even their anniversaries with the organizations, calling them out. Mm -hmm. um, one very obvious one is if you ever see them in person, thank them. That actually goes a very long way. Sure. Um tracking their hours worked and communicating their overall impact on a regular basis. It's really motivating for people. You know, you could even give out certificates when they've achieved a certain amount of hours worked within the organization. Sure. Um, I yeah. think too, something like call outs. So mm -hmm. calling them out so that everyone across the organization, even the paid employees know who they are mm -hmm. or, you know, those appreciation posts on social media. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen some organizations even go as far as hosting award ceremonies at the end of the year, um, or even just uh, calling out and celebrating National Volunteer Week every year. It always happens in April. That's something um, you could do too. One thing I do want to mention too is is when you think about kind of all of those little micro tasks and those micro interactions is what I call them, managing those across an entire base of volunteer can kind of seem overwhelming, right? If you have a base of 800, 1,000 volunteers, how do I kind of make sure I'm hitting all of those touch points? Yeah. And I, I will say, however, that um, there are volunteer management systems out there, in, including Bloomerang Volunteer, that kind of help with automating some of those really key touch points so that you can still focus on your mission, but also keep that thankfulness more personal, more meaningful, more frequent too. So, so it's not just, you know, a full-time job of making sure everyone's getting hit, right? You can, you kind of automate all that. Great tips. And I, I just want to state that many of them did not cost a lot, if anything at all, right? Like I love the, and it seems so simple, but when you see a volunteer, think a volunteer, right? Mm-hmm. And some of the organizations I've had the privilege to work with, Melissa, uh, they give them a different color lanyard or a different color t-shirt. And so they really stand out. And how amazing if like during the day, right, they received multiple thank yous from staff members and that goes such a long way. So a yeah. lot of the tips you said really didn't cost a lot of money. Yeah, it's like you can just breed that culture within your organization too and just teach everyone that that's a thing. Yeah, yeah I love it. that's a thing. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Melissa, talk to us about this one because this is also one of those interesting things that I don't think enough of us do or if we do it, it happens very quickly. And you say best practice number three, provide that volunteer with an orientation is that something that is done digitally or in person before they get there? I mean, what does your structure look like for that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So short answer is both, but for this one, when I think about volunteer orientation, I like to put myself in the shoes of a first time volunteer, right? So sometimes it can be very intimidating to show up to a job site that you've never been to, right? You don't know anyone. You don't know where to go. You're not really sure how to do the task at hand. Um, And it can be a really uncomfortable situation for some people. And as an administrator, if you have multiple people in the same boat, kind of showing up at the same time, not knowing what to do or where to go, things can get disorganized pretty quickly and can actually turn into a little bit of a liability issue, right? Like think about that situation happening in a warehouse with heavy machinery, yeah. right? So um, putting a plan together ahead of time and inviting volunteers to an orientation before the actual work starts is a really good idea, right? So again, this could be that virtual training session. Um, there's a lot of value in providing that session in person. Um, I find there's always extra motivation too for people to come in when there's food involved. So I've seen a few organizations bribe people, you know, with a little pizza party to come on in. But yeah, that that training session, you'll have a chance to walk people through their roles, their responsibilities, rules, expectations, even, you know, um, hone in on the organization's mission, right? And and kind of echo that. You'll also be able to use that time to walk them through the volunteer management system you're using, or even the workflows that you've set up as an organization to kind of track them and their attendance. But I I think for me personally, I do like the in-person if if you're able to, and, and you know, it's not an actual virtual training session. Um, it's super important because volunteers will be able to ask their questions ahead of time which will boost their confidence, right? But it will also, what I love about this is that it will give them a chance to meet their other team members. So kind of get to know people ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then most importantly, obviously, you're going to avoid that first day disorganization of people, you know, not knowing what to do or where to go. Melissa, are you seeing some organizations automating this? So you know, really creating perhaps an evergreen orientation video or maybe some elements, right, can be automated into a video to shorten the orientation, perhaps an in-person orientation. What are you seeing for that? 
Yeah. So sometimes I see people pre-schedule a virtual session, kind of like a Zoom meeting. It's like, okay, everyone tune in on this date. We're going to do a live presentation. Yeah. Um, other ones I have seen automate through a learning management system. So they actually have to go through steps and training and fill out quizzes and responses on 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 the rules that they're about to do too. Um, so yeah, th there's different ways you can take it, but great. Yeah. 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 I love it. You know, I think it's such an important thing too, especially in, in an environment where you might have disclosure issues such as HIPAA, working with minors, um, you know, safety issues and domestic violence, stuff like that. I mean, this would be the time where that gets addressed or, or would it be more back in the job description? How do you see that play out? So usually um, part of the screening process, um, if there is something that would require, you know, a background check ahead of time, mm -hmm. usually the background check should be approved before they even attend the yeah. training session and start learning about some of those more in-depth materials on, sure. on the role. Yeah, that's, and that's then, good advice. Yeah, that's really good advice. And then what about, I think for the fourth one, we're going to talk about defining goals um, and how we measure success. Is that mentioned in the orientation or when does that come into play? Good question. Uh, that is a great question, actually. <laughs> Me personally, yes, I would love to hit on that in the orientation, but I think it would go a much further way if you kind of sprinkle those impacts over a regular frequent occurrence to the volunteers. Okay. Um, but just like any volunteer program, right, um, in your organization, or any program at all in your organization, it needs to be clear, the goals need to be set, and you need to figure out a way to measure what success looks like, right? So from a volunteer perspective, six tricks could include things like volunteer satisfaction ratings. Maybe you want to survey them and see how they're doing and how they're actually feeling about everything. Um, overall attendance rates, right? Like it's one thing to have people sign up. It's another thing to have people show up, right? So how many people are signing up versus showing up? Um, anything to do with recruitment, really. So how many net new volunteers did you bring into the organization? How many are repeat volunteers, right? Retention rates are really important. Um, one thing that's also really important too is is measuring your turnover rates so understanding who isn't coming back and why right so so on average actually i have a little stat here from the volunteer management progress report from 2023 on average uh, across organizations 15.4 percent of volunteers become inactive or churn within the organization every month so how can we measure that and how can we figure out how to get that number reduced, right? The highest level. Yeah, that that's important because I know many of our friends in the nonprofit sector really rely on their volunteers to, you know, to fulfill their mission. So we we need to keep them happy for sure and keep them coming back. Yeah. And I think too, once you figure out the metrics that you want to define, it's going to better help you communicate your overall impact to your volunteers too, right? Um, and, and having them achieve that mission. Yeah. You know, Melissa, I love the direction that you're taking us on. And one of the things that just kind of struck me with is, is that, and I'd love to get your feedback on that, is, is there a difference in some of these best practices for like a one and done, a group, a one day action um, versus an ongoing, you're going to be here every Tuesday from four to six. I mean, do we look at these types of volunteer experiences in a different way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So having something that can kind of break those types of volunteers down, there's what we call episodic volunteers that, you know, show up sporadically throughout the year. Then you have your hardcore continuous ones who've been with the organization for 10 years. You have your one-time volunteers, right? Maybe you're running one-time fundraiser where you need to kind of bring in a lot of people, maybe some volunteer groups too. So um, breaking it down at that level and measuring those rates even, super helpful. You I know, think, I Julia, we're going to have to have her back on. I know yeah. we're not done, but to talk completely about like donor, re or sorry, volunteer retention. Yeah, much I think donor so. retention. <laughs> I think so too, because okay. I'm, I'm struck by that. Yeah. Um, and, and I know, I mean, like intuitively I can sense that, but to really apply metrics to it 
and to really understand how we can be measuring that. Um, I was just remind, reminded of a, a really interesting story that a CEO told me of a major uh, food kitchen situation. And he had a volunteer that was that served the dinner rolls at this, this uh, kitchen. And he had done it for more than 25 years. And a, an, an international celebrity came through for like a media event. And they said, oh, here, this would be a great photo op Please, you serve the roles to the people coming through the line. And the volunteer freaked out and he said, no way, this is my job. I've been doing this for 25 years. And right. it caused like a big brouhaha. Because, yeah. yeah, this yeah. was like, no, I'm not, this is my job. And it was literally putting a role on a plate, right? Yeah, yeah. But it, was, it was a fascinating thing. And, I, and hearing you speak about this, um, it really kind of made me rem remind, reminded me of that. Last but not least, and this is something that I would have never really put into your best practices, create a budget. Wah, wah. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so even though your volunteers are technically working for free, there is always an associated cost to managing humans and to successfully running a program, right? So there are certain expenses that you're going to want to plan for and budget for. Um, I kind of have a list of ideas too to, to help you think about um, some things you might want to consider. Um, but yeah, first and foremost, your overall tooling, right? So um, your chosen volunteer management system um, mm -hmm. that you're going to be using. There are things like recruitment and training materials, project materials. Um, we mentioned this earlier, but if your organization requires background checks, right, for certain roles, like you're going to be working with children, yeah. that also has a cost that you'll want to consider covering on behalf of your volunteers. Now, depending on the organization, sometimes the volunteers have to front that, but um, it is one of those little nice to haves if you can cover that for your volunteers if you require it. Um, and I mentioned to volunteer recognition earlier. So depending how far you want to take that, right? If you want to run that entire award ceremony or like a gala or a dinner, um, even if you just want to print off, you know, those little certificates based on the number of hours they work, that there's a cost to that too. Some things that people actually don't consider is the additional time that your paid staff and employees have to dedicate yes. to that volunteer program. There's an associated cost there. Mm -hmm. And then again, just back to managing humans, supporting volunteers. So if they're working really long hours. You might want to consider food, drink, uh, travel budget, any reimbursements they might have. Uh, t-shirts is huge with volunteers. You're going to see volunteers wearing all sorts of t-shirts. Um, yeah. All those kind of little expenses add up to. Um, and I actually do have a stat too that I want to share um, from that volunteer management 2023 status report. The average budget size set aside for volunteer management programs for organizations is between five and ten thousand dollars per volunteer uh, per organization per organization for the whole program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That is a good stat to know. Yeah. It is. yeah. And because it's not very much money for what the effect is, but at the same time, Melissa, it it can be a real big expense if you're not doing it right. Right. Yeah, exactly. You no, know, yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. seems like one of those things, it's like looking at what, what's going to be the, you know, the outcome and the ROI of that super, super important. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm fascinated that you have um, dedicated yourself to this concept. We talk about volunteerism so much. I think we have a culture in North America uh, um, that involves volunteerism. It's in our schools. It's in our you know, faith centers, it's within our social groups, but we don't talk about the management of it very much, which Jared, don't you think that's odd? It, it's, of course, it's very odd. You know? <laughs> we tend to do, do things a, a little backwards, but you know, this, this thing makes me think about the Giving USA report that came out, right? Which shockingly was saying that giving is down, but volunteerism is up. Yeah. And so here we are talking about this. And so the management of this, the culture of gratitude for this, super, super important. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they want to feel known. They want to feel appreciated, informed. And ultimately, they, they want to have a good experience with your organization, right? And, and that all factors into your overall retention rates. Yeah. 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 And there's so many social benefits to volunteerism as well, right? Like oh, yeah. natural endorphins come from this. Uh, you know, it increases self-esteem and uh, sense of community, sense of belonging. So there's a lot of really good benefits. One of the things we talked about, um, I, probably in the green room, uh, Julia, was about the multi-generational conversations we've had over the course of the four years here at the nonprofit show. But we see a variety of generations. And again, Melissa, I'm going to have you booked for like six more shows after this. Yes, please. Oh, I'm so <laughs> excited. Yeah. <laughs> to talk about like how to in how to attract, how to engage, and how to retain multi generations, right? And like, Absolutely. what does that look like? Because there's so many individuals that want to be of service at all ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you think about like the the types of people who are volunteering, right? You have your kids who are probably in high school and need to collect some volunteer hours and they're very digitally savvy. Yeah. And then the opposite side of that, you have people who are coming into retirement who have all this free time on their hands, but maybe they're not as digitally savvy as some of the younger generations. And how do you accommodate for that too? And yeah, even in Bloomerang Volunteer, we have all sorts of features and stuff that that can accommodate both ends of the spectrum too. Well, yeah. you have been a fascinating guest. I'm just going to recap um, the best practices that you share. Number one, create the job description. Number two, value those volunteers that you do have. Provide an orientation is number three. For four, we have define and measure uh, those goals as well as success. And then the fifth one is that budget. So Melissa, you have been fantastic. I'm Melissa Pennard, head of product, sorry, yes, product management, Bloomerang Volunteer, bloomerang.com. Uh, please do check her out and the system. Really fascinating and a really big tool that makes up the, the entire ecosystem of our sector. So thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we are getting you back on team, the nonprofit show. So just yes. be-, be <laughs> Please do, I'm so ready. There's so much to talk about. There is, and we need to be talking about this. And so this is super cool. I have really learned a lot from you, uh, Melissa. So thank you again so much. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. i been joined today by my trusty sidekick, uh, <laughs> the nonprofit nerd, Jarrett R. Ransom. Again, we are here talking to amazing folks like Melissa because of our wonderful partnerships that include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy, National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. You know, these are the folks that join us day in and day out so that we can have these amazing conversations. Yesterday, it was about um, staffing uh, nonprofit labor. I mean, it, it's different every single day. And so this has really been an amazing thing to get these folks to see the value and what we're doing and, and, and get their support. Um, I am really excited about so many of the things that you talked about today. It renews my spirit in how we can harness the um, goodwill and the intention of our communities, um, but yet it's not a guarantee. We need, to, we need to steward it and we need to work it and understand. And so I loved your approach, Melissa. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we like to remind you to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.